Who's ready to wind down the year and just sort of chill out, just cruise on in last few days before Christmas? Who's ready to wind down the clock? No, you all want to keep working hard? All right, now we're all, okay, well, I've got, I got good news and I've got bad news. Um, we, we have got a lot of teaching and scripture to get through this morning, so we are not winding down the clock this morning. I apologize in advance, but the good news is all the groundwork has been done in the weeks in the lead up, and so we're just tying a lot of this together because we are in our theme at the moment of Emmanuel, which is God with us, which is really the miracle of Christmas. In John 1.14, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he goes on to say, and we beheld his glory as, a, as an imagery of when John actually beheld him at the Mount Transfiguration, that, that John actually saw not only Jesus, but also Moses and Elijah in their glorified state, in their glorified bodies, uh, which is an interesting encounter. But John, having beheld Jesus in his glory, saw the culmination and the fulfillment of everything that was initiated at Christmas. Christmas is the beginning, Easter is the center point, but there is a culmination that is coming in our future, and this is actually the aspect of Emmanuel that I want to talk about this morning. Now, at first it's going to seem a little bit out of the box, but when you think about it, this is actually a great Christmas message because I want to speak this morning about the rapture. the resurrection of the dead, and when Jesus comes to collect his bride. This really is, you think about it, first you're like, well, preaching the rapture at Christmas time doesn't quite make sense, but when you think about it, that actually is the fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us. And what you might be interested to find out is that the very first person who introduces the doctrine of the rapture is Jesus himself. He does it in John 14. We're going to end there. That's going to make more sense when we end there. But in John 14, this is the first time that the rapture gets introduced to us. It's, Paul refers to it as a mystery. Now, mystery is not just a, a descripting adjective that Paul uses. It's a, it's a theological term. It's a biblical term. What it, what it technically means is that it was hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. There are seven mysteries in Scripture that we can actually refer to and, and identify them. One is actually us, the church. You don't really see the church in the Old Testament. But then you get to the book of Ephesians and it says that Jesus, or God, had the church planted and planned in his mind, in his heart, before the world was even formed. So it's not like the church was plan B or an afterthought, it was just a mystery in the old, revealed in the new. You see many mysteries revealed when Jesus is talking to his disciples in the upper room. The upper room, when you see a revelation revealed there... Uh, it's often a revelation directly to the church itself. And in John 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples, excuse me, talking to his disciples, giving a direct revelation of a mystery that was hidden in the old, revealed in the new. And the culmination of this mystery in the rapture is that we, as the bride of Christ, Paul says it this way, that those who are alive and remain will be with the Lord, that we'll be with him that that will actually be Emmanuel, God with us. And, and if you haven't been following along with our series up to this point, the point of Emmanuel is this, that I believe, and this is conjecture on my behalf, conjecture on my behalf, I, I believe one of God's favorite names about himself is Emmanuel, yes. is God with us. God's got many names. Each of his names reveals an aspect of his character. In the beginning of the Bible, he's revealed as El Elyon, which is God Most High. That that's one of the first ways he reveals himself, particularly to Abraham, and that is that he is the God Most High. But then we travel in Scripture, and different names get revealed. He gets revealed as uh, as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He gets revealed as El Shaddai, the the, the All Sufficient One. And and each revelation of God's name is a revelation of His character. So when we get to Emmanuel, it's a name of God that reveals his character. So what's it revealing? It's revealing this. God wants to be with you. God wants to be with you. See, the idea of religion is we're trying to get to God. God, I want to be with you. God, I want to perform for you. God, I want to earn my way into your presence. But the absolute crazy idea and mind-boggling concept 
that is repeatedly delivered to us and revealed to us from the narrative of Genesis through to Revelation is that God is scheming, planning, and redeeming ways for Him to be with us. That in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't Adam saying to God, God, where are you? It was God saying to humanity, where are you? I want to be with you. And so let's have a journey through Scripture today. And like I said, we're not just going to run the clock down on this. We've got some work to do this morning. So have you got your notepads? Have you got your iPads? Have you got your iPhones? Have you got anything at all? All right. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And for those not familiar with this exact passage of Scripture, this is pretty much the proof text for the rapture. Now, can I lay some ground rules for the rapture? Because sometimes people go a bit nuts about this. Um, I I don't really want to get too involved in the timing this morning, pre, mid, post. And if you're not familiar with those concepts, that people place this in different aspects of the timeline in our future. Um, And I'm going to speak to that a little bit. I'll be up front with you. In the, in the rules of interpretation that I engage with in the Bible, which is a historical, grammatical interpretation, also known as a lip, literal application. I subscribe personally to a pre-tribulation rapture. That's pretty common for our denomination and persuasion of faith in the charismatic Pentecostal um, side of Christianity. That, that's pretty normal. That's probably orthodox for our persuasion. However, if you're mid or post or pre wrath or any other option... We don't need to um, have a debate or an argument about it. The details of that, I'm happy to agree with you on those because generally the mid and the post and the pre-wrath all agree on this one point, that we are not appointed under wrath. What we disagree about is just when wrath actually starts in the tribulation. So even if you're mid-tribulation, it's because you generally believe that God's wrath isn't poured out until three and a half years into the tribulation. Um, or if you're pre-wrath, that's pretty self-explanatory, it's in the title, that, that's about three-quarter mark through the tribulation. So here's the thing, what I'm trying to say is, we're actually in massive agreement, probably 98% agreement, let's not get caught up in the 2%, all right? But I'm also declaring my, my position early up, so you know where I'm coming from, but I'm also happy for you to be mid, post, whatever you like. What I want to focus on is not the when, I want to focus on the why, The why is what I want to have a look at this morning, because at the base of the why, you'll see a beautiful love story which culminates in this motif, and that is God wants to be with you, the bride of Christ. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Let's have a look at what Scripture actually has to say. Uh, It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Let's stop right there. Um, here's, Here's the thing. This is why God put this in Scripture. Holy Spirit inspired Scripture. And the reason he put the rapture in here is because he didn't want you to be ignorant of it. Uh, Also, the Apostle Paul, he also said that. He's like, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. There tends to be sometimes a little bit of a mentality that we don't need to worry about this. We don't need to concern ourselves with this. This is irrelevant and fringe to the gospel. Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, It was introduced by Jesus. It was taught by Paul. Uh, And matter of fact, when he did teach it, He starts out, and he says it again later on, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I want you to be aware of what this actually involves. So let's go on. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord... I want you just to pay attention to that as well. Paul actually went to a Bible college known as Holy Spirit Bible College. Um, He was literally taught by the Spirit of God himself. And so when Paul says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, what he literally means is, I'm telling you about this doctrine of the rapture as it was told to me by God himself. Like this is not some conjecture, not something that Paul thought of after he, you know, had maybe a pizza that had sat in the fridge a little bit too long and he thought about it the next day after some crazy dreams. Like, this is not what's going on here. Uh, This was actually taught to Paul by the Lord and now he's reiterating it to this church. By the way, he planted the church at Thessalonica. Um, This is a church plant that he did and so he's got an affinity with these people. Uh, And these are a young church and they're actually writing to him 
because they're concerned about some things. So this is a pastor and apostle uh, instructing a young fledgling church which he planted and trying to encourage them in this, in some sound doctrine. This is what he says, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Listen to the language around this. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. The Lord Himself will descend from... I love how personal that is. It's the Lord Himself. He's not sending some angels to go collect you. Uh, He's not even sending chariots of fire like He did with Elijah. No, it's the Lord Himself that will come, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. What's the why behind the rapture? That verse there. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Emmanuel. What's God's desire? God's desire is thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This actually is, I believe, pretty much integral to our Christian faith, is that we um, have this a beautiful hope, a hope that's not found in the world, that we at any moment could behold our Saviour, our King and our Lord and our God face to face, the lover of our souls. At any moment, we can look forward to that. No matter what's happening in the world, no matter what's happening in a geopolitical sense or an environmentalist sense or, you know, what's happening with pandemics around the world or what's happening with with different world leaders threatening nuclear war or... We don't... uh, As much as that is a concern, I'm not saying to bury your head in the sand, ultimately what we do know is that the hope that we have in Jesus Christ outweighs anything that we will face in this world. Uh, I was uh, watching the cricket yesterday, which was an amazing, praise the Lord, hallelujah, can I get a shunder, amen. That was just a beautiful thing to watch. And, uh, and at the end of the innings, um, the, the news went on, and, and I just, I, I just kind of caught the headlines, and then I was kind of sucked into the news, I don't really watch news, by the way, I, I generally don't watch it, um, because, particularly national news, because it's just so depressing, it's just so so faith-destroying and fear-increasing. I just don't open expose my spirit to that. Um, but anyway, I got sucked in, and, and before I knew it, I'd, I'd, I'd heard about three people who got murdered, and I heard about, uh, you know, obviously all the COVID news again, and, and before I know I'm just thinking, man, this world has gone crazy. Like, what in the world is going on? Uh, but then, so I, so I turned it off and, and, and quickly got my head out of that space. But this is the reason, one of the reasons why we encourage each other is because when the world is going crazy, we can say to each other, hey, you don't need to worry about how crazy this world is and how evil men can be in their hearts because the future of the world is held in the hands of a, of a benevolent king who is coming to restore the Prince of Peace himself, restore peace to the whole world. And it's an encouragement. Um, to each other. Um, I happened to go to Movie World this week with some of, some of the team. We were celebrating, having a Christmas party at, at Movie World, and uh, and I was w- on the on the big Joker ro- roller coaster. You know, the big purple one you see out the front, like the real big one. And we're on that, and we're all buckled in. I'd, I'd psyched myself up, and, and uh, we're, we're just about ready to go. And um, and the technician is like. Okay, everybody off. We're just having some problems with the computer locking the seatbelt function. <laughs> so we get off and they call maintenance. Maintenance is not who you want called just before you go on a roller coaster. <laughs> and so maintenance comes, and in my mind, I'm like, do I stay? Like, do I want to be the first person on this roller coaster after maintenance? has been called, do I, surely there's some other people in this line that want to go before me now, like, do we wait, do we go, and, you know, because I was with other blokes, you don't want to be the first guy that says, I'm out, I'm sorry, like, you don't want to be that, you don't want to be that chicken bloke, right? So testosterone got the better of me, you know, because I didn't want to be that guy, and so we stayed, and maintenance come, they fix it, and he's like, yeah, it's just a bit of rain, you know, when rain gets in there, just, you know, it, it'll, you know, it'll be fine. Well, I'm sorry, it'll be fine, was not reassuring to my soul. But 
because I didn't want to be caught in cowardice, I'm now sitting on this roller coaster, the first people through after maintenance was called because the seatbelt function had broken and I'm going up this incline and I tell you, the rapture was no more an encouragement to me as my life is hurtling downwards. This is, this is, this is kind of how our world can be at times. We're not, we're not, we're not sure how this is all going to end and where it's all going to play out and, and, and where the news headlines is going to take us next. So that's why God inbuilt into us a mystery into the gospel, a mystery that we could encourage each other with. We can say, don't worry about how crazy the world gets, Jesus is coming. And here's the encouraging part about it. He's going to take you before it gets real crazy. Now, don't get me wrong, there is tribulation in the world, but let me tell you this, it's not capital T, tribulation. And it's bad. Matter of fact, there are more Christian martyrs today than the entirety of all the other 19 preceding centuries put together. Over 50% of the church lives in persecution. Like, we are in tribulation, don't get me wrong, but it's not the tribulation. And it's not God's wrath. Let me have a couple of cracks at encouraging you. Can I have a couple of attempts at encouraging you? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Can I have a couple of attempts at this? Let me, let's have a first attempt. Brethren, there is going to be asteroids hitting the earth. And two-thirds of the world's population is going to be wiped out by either a world political leader, famine, disease war, or demons that are released from the bowels of the earth. But that's okay. After you get through all that, Jesus comes. Anybody feeling encouraged right now? Anyone feeling comforted right now? All right, all right, all right. I'm new to this pastoring things. Let me have another crack at it. Maybe this for comfort. Brethren, I want you to know that God is going to pour out His wrath on all humanity and judge the nations and all the evil that has been perpetrated at the hands of men and nations is going to be judged by the Lord in His justice and in His wrath. But before that happens, you are going to be removed out of the way and you are going to be with the Lord in heaven while all of this is happening. Who is comforted by that? All right, okay second attempt was a lot better. Well, this is what Paul is actually saying, because tribulation and persecution was part of the times that the church at Thessalonica existed in as well. And they had Christians that were already dying, and they were writing to Paul saying, have they missed out? Have they missed out on the return of the Lord? And Paul is comforting the church, this young fledgling church plant, by saying, they haven't missed out. They're going to be with the Lord in the air forever. And matter of fact, those who are alive and remain will actually be caught up The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will go with them to meet the Lord in the air. Before, and in chapter 5, it goes on to talk about the day of the Lord. This is all before the day of the Lord. In chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, it's all us, we, together, church. Chapter 5, it gets to the day of the Lord. The language changes to them, those, others. And so the timing of this is imperative here. Now, let me just deal with a couple of details first, because this might be a new doctrine to you. Um, sometimes people say, uh, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. And that's, that's technically correct, um, but neither is the word trinity. So that's probably not the strongest argument to lead with. And if you go on down that line, the word Bible isn't in the Bible. So it's probably not a great reason to throw out the doctrine of the rapture. However, the word rapture is in the Bible if you have a Latin Bible. Um, so if you've got a Latin Bible, the word rapture is in the Bible. However, it's translated into Greek for us and then into English, and the word in Greek is hapazo, and that actually exists. There are six different hapazos in the Bible. There's three in the Old Testament, three in the New Year. First of all, Enoch was raptured, which is a picture of the church. And guess what? Was that before the flood, during the flood, or after the flood? It was before the flood. Enoch walked with the Lord and was no more. Uh, So Enoch was raptured before the flood. There was also um, Isaiah was raptured, and he he went up to heaven, but then came back down. That's in Isaiah 6. He actually went into the Lord's presence. 
Uh, and then Elijah, chariots of fire, that's another rapture that happened, and, and he was taken, you know about that one. Then there was uh, Philip in the, in the book of Acts, you remember Philip, he was raptured, he was a literal, physical translation of his body. Uh, then Paul was uh, raptured as well. Um, and if those five haven't convinced you, in Revelation 12, it also says that Jesus was raptured, Hapatso. Jesus was raptured in Revelation 12 as the son of the virgin that was taken into heaven. So there are six raptures already, even before you get to our rapture. But you might say, well, there's never been a worldwide rapture. Good point. However, there was also this guy called Noah who built this boat before there was ever rain, before there was ever a worldwide flood. And he, for 120 years, talked about a worldwide event that no one had ever seen, never existed, and that was the vehicle that God used to bring about his plans in the world. And Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the return of the Son of Man. So there will be a worldwide event that's no, never been happened before, and it is our encouragement. Now, can you imagine Noah preaching for 120 years? He would have looked like an idiot, building a boat, the size boat that it was, and, and not even just for like three to six months or 12-month project. No, 120 years. Can you imagine in year 113? Uh, can you imagine what he was called around town? Well, that's like us, the church. You know, we, we, we talk about the rapture and we talk about it. And do you, can you hear the names that people call us and how crazy people think we are? I just embrace it. I've got good, you know, uh, non-Christian friends and I, I just, I just, I own it. I'm like, now, I want you to know, if I ever disappear, get to a church because it's all about to go down. And you will know at that point what I was talking about was accurate. Right? So I just embrace it. I mean, I mean, Noah sounded like, he must have sounded like that. So, so I'm, I'm happy to sound like that as well. But um, it, I want you also to know it's quite orthodox. There's actually some um, early church fathers um, from the patri- what we call the patristic period. And uh, one of them was uh, Justin Martyr, and he was a contemporary of another guy called Irenaeus, who's certainly one of, the, um, one of the forebears of the Christian faith. And he says this, he says, But I... And every other completely orthodox Christian feels certain that there will be a resurrection of the flesh, followed by a thousand years in the rebuilt, embellished and enlarged city of Jerusalem, as was announced by the prophets Ezekiel, Isaiah and the others. That was Justin Martyr. He's looking to a physical resurrection and a literal establishment of the kingdom of God here on planet Earth. So we're in good company with Justin Martyr, but there's another guy called Irenaeus, who I just um, told you about then. He's significant because he was actually a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp's significant because he was a disciple of John, the revelator. So John's disciples taught this guy, Irenaeus, and this is what Irenaeus says about the rapture. He says, and therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, there shall be tribulation such as not been since the beginning, neither shall be. So we, we know that Jesus revealed it, Paul taught it, the early church fathers, the disciples of the disciples reiterated it, and also there's good textual evidence for it as well. Uh, in the book of Revelation itself, um, the word ecclesia, which is the word for the church, the Greek word for the church, is used 19 times in between Revelation chapter 1 and 3. 19 times the word ecclesia, the church, is used 19 times. Then it's not used from chapter 4 through to chapter 19, which is where the tribulation happens. Tribulation starts at Revelation 6, but from Revelation 4, you don't see the word ecclesia. Why? You see the word saints, you see the word elect, you see, you see believers, you even see martyrs, but you don't see the church. What happens in Revelation chapter 4? By the way, it reappears in Revelation chapter 21, which we're about to look at. So before the tribulation, ecclesia is used, after the tribulation, ecclesia is used, in the middle, nothing. Let's have a look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, let's see what happens there. After these things, he'd just gone through Revelation 1, 2, 3, talking about the church, ecclesia, 19 times, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, now, what does First Thessalonians say? For the Lord Himself 
will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet. So we've got a trumpet here, speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you these things which must take place after this. I believe that's John experiencing the rapture himself. Immediately, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne in heaven and one who sat on the throne. Okay, so he's, he's gone from Patmos and now he's experiencing heaven. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now pay attention to this. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Who in heaven has white robes and crowns of gold on their head? The church. But, if you don't... Believe me, I'll go even a step further. What does the number 24 represent? Number 24 doesn't appear in Scripture very often, but there are very strong um, um, iterations of it when it does, and that is this, that two priests representing each tribe, you'd have 24 priests, which would then be a visual representation of the whole priesthood. If you've got 24 priests, you've got the whole nation of Israel, the whole priesthood of the elect of God. So, if you see 24 elders in heaven, what does it mean? It means that the whole priesthood is in heaven. The church is in heaven, clothed in white robes, crowned in gold crowns. Here's the other thing, sitting down. Angels don't sit down. Jesus sits down and so do we. So, it's the church. In heaven, from Revelation chapter 4. That, then you don't see the word ecclesia again until Revelation chapter 21. You see the word saints, you see the elect, you see a whole bunch of other things. All right. How are you going? We're going somewhere. I've got eight minutes and 19 seconds to get, get there, but we're going somewhere. <laughs> if you're not convinced yet, see, because th- this is the thing, we don't talk about this very, it's not taught very often. Like, this isn't a common, common topic in church. Matter of fact, there was a recent survey of 400 sermons done across churches, and they analysed which scriptures they used in their, in their sermons. Now, listen to this. 27% of the Bible is prophetic. Future, future foretelling, right? So, 27% of scripture is future foretelling. Do you know how many out of the 400 sermons were about the Lord's return and about future events? 2%. 27% of the Bible is about the return of the Lord. One in every 25 verses, I've told you this before, is concerned with the Lord's return. For every one mention of His first coming, there are eight mentions of His second coming. So, for every, every Christmas message, we should have eight messages about the return. If we're representing scripture appropriately. Right? And, 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 and this is why Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of these things. I, I want you to understand what's happening in our future. Why? Because it's such a beautiful part of our faith. Um, A.W. Tozer says this way. He has a quote, another, another really good Christian author. He says, the essence of Christianity is wrapped up in the expectation of Jesus' imminent return. This is what the prophets and the apostles taught, and it accords with all the New Testament teachers. Right here, we have the beating heart of our holy faith and where our Christian interests and the future hope lie. The blessed hope clearly defines for us what Christianity is all about. This is not some fringe topic that people who wear socks and sandals and stay up way too late watching YouTube and Googling stuff in weird parts of Christian doctrine talk about. No, this is central to the Christian gospel. This This is orthodox Christianity. What I say is this way, is that the empty tomb guarantees the returning king. If all we teach in the gospel is an empty tomb, we've missed half the story. What's the point in an empty tomb if the king doesn't return and come and collect his bride? This is the gospel. Another way I say it, this is a catchphrase, you, you, you know, hang out with me long enough, you'll say it, that if his first coming is the good news, then his second coming is the great news. This is the future hope of our hearts, what we look forward to. This is what we want. Let me show you, there's a difference between rapture and return. Um, It should be a a slide, just outline this, because this is quite a lot to actually go through. But in in the rapture, what we just read, Christ comes in the air. Um, But in the return, Christ comes to the earth. Um, As a matter of fact, when we go to Israel, we go to the Mount of Olives, and that's actually where He lands, the same place that He he departed, the same place that He went up. 
It's the same place he comes back, prophesied in Zechariah 14, 4, and, and Israel says, where did you get those wounds in your hands? And, and Jesus says, in the house of my friends. Uh, and when he lands, actually, he lands on Mount of Olives, and there's actually a massive earth, earthquake that actually separates uh, right through the Kidron Valley. Anyway, we'll, we'll cover that when we go to Israel. Um, Christ comes for his saints in 1 Thessalonians, we just read that, but in the return, Christ comes with his saints. In, in the rapture, uh, believers depart the earth, but in the return, unbelievers will be taken away, and they're gathered by angels. In the rapture, Christ claims his bride, but in the return, Christ comes with his bride. In the rapture, Christ gathers his own, in the return, angels gather the elect. In the rapture, Christ comes to reward which is why it's a comfort and, a, and an encouragement to us, but in the, in the return, Christ comes to judge. In the rapture, it's not in the Old Testament, but the return predicted often in the Old Testament. The return is out of that 27%, the biggest portion of that 27% is the millennial reign, which most of our verses we get from the Old Testament. There are no signs it is imminent, and I've dealt with that in another message. Um, however, the return is portended by many signs. Matter of fact, it is, it is so down to the clock, you can literally set your watch to it. Yeah. Uh, once you see um, certain things unfold, you can guarantee when Jesus will return, down to the very day, which, by the way, you did for his first coming as well. Daniel had a prophecy that, that um, at the end of the 69th week, Messiah would be revealed, and it was down to the very, very day. We call that Palm Sunday. That was the day that Jesus turned up to Jerusalem. Daniel prophesied it down to the very day. His second coming, same thing, down to the very day. It is a time of blessing and comfort, but the return, it's a time of destruction and judgment. Rapture involves believers only, but the return involves Israel and the Gentiles. I've got much more we could go through, and, and you know what? We've got plenty of time to hang out, and I can teach you more about the rapture as we go along. But like I said, I want to get to the why. And this is where I want to really focus on this morning, particularly around Christmas time, why? I told you that the first person to introduce the rapture was Jesus himself, and he did that in the upper room discourse, and uh, that's in John 14, if you want to turn to your Bibles there or look to the screens, and it says this, let not your hearts be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. Pay attention to this, to this phrase, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, the reason why um, this is so significant is because you've got to look at this through Jewish eyes, because he's speaking to a bunch of Jews here, Jewish lads, and, and they would have understood the language that was involved in this. To understand it on a more deeper level, you've got to understand how Jews got married, particularly Galileans. There are certain rituals around a Galilean marriage that, that all of these phrases are involved in. And first of all, what you would do in a Galilean wedding is you'd get families to agree on what's called a ketubah, which is basically a, a, for a really weak kind of alignment in our culture, but the closest we have is a prenuptial agreement. Basically, the families get together and do a prenup for this arranged marriage. And, you know, these are going to be the wife's responsibilities. These are going to be the man's responsibilities. And if the families are happy, they exchange a, a, a bride price. Well, there, there is a massive gift given for the bride, a.k.a. Holy Spirit. The promised one is given to us. And then after the ketubah, the covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31, a new covenant I will make with you, a ketubah, a new ketubah I'll make with you. Then there is what the, the groom pours what's called a cup of joy, which is a cup of wine, and he presents it to his bride. And the bride at that point, now this is the only Middle Eastern culture that left the ultimate power in the women's hands. She could either drink the cup and accept the ketubah and, and the betrothal, or she could reject it. She had, she had power of veto, the only Middle Eastern culture to do that. If she drank the cup of joy, well, for us, what's called the cup of redemption, which is our cup of communion, which also happened in the upper room, then she accepted the marriage proposal. And once she accepted the marriage proposal, she would do this in front of everybody, by the way. This would be a public demonstration. It would happen at the city gate, where all the elders and the lawyers and the wise people, city leaders would all sit. And this would happen in front of everyone. She would publicly accept the cup of joy. And if she did this, then the groom 
would then go back to his father's house and he would prepare a place for them to live for the first year of their marriage. And so he would say in front of everyone, he says, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus saying this to his disciples, what are the disciples thinking? He's talking about marriage. He wants to marry us. And here's the thing. The groom can only go and collect the bride when the father says the house is ready. So it's the father that holds the time on which Jesus is going to return. But if you think about it really practically, this is what this means. This is the why. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you so that where he is, you may be also because you're his bride. You're the bride of Christ. And the father is looking over the preparations that the son is performing in preparing for you a mansion, preparing for you a home to live in, in heaven, in the Father's house, where you can enjoy your marriage supper of the lamb in. And here's the thing, it's only when the Father says, okay, it's ready, it's now time. Go collect your bride, son. The other thing is the groom oversees the marriage preparations. You know, like in Western culture, it's, you know, basically us us guys, we just nod and say yes to whatever the bride wants, like because, you know, mostly, and also because we're a bit lazy as well. And it's like, I know you're better with that stuff, dear. And, and, you know, the the, the bride basically sorts out all the detail. Well, in, in Middle Eastern culture, in Jewish culture, it's the groom that prepares the reception, the wedding banquet, organizes the wine, the meal, the food, the everything. So Jesus is preparing the marriage banquet in heaven for when we actually get collected by him. But you know what the bride's responsibility is? She's got to prepare herself. She's got to be always ready because she never knows when the son or when the, when the groom is going to come because it's up to the father. So she always has to be ready. Part of the doctrine of the rapture is so that you will always be ready. You've got to prepare yourself. You've actually got to say, you know what? I'm going to be ready for Jesus at any moment, which means I'm going to live by grace, through faith, the holiness that He's called me to live, that I'm going to always have my heart attitude correct in whatever I take on for Jesus. And I live with a beautiful anticipation so that when the Father says, Son, go collect your bride, we're ready. That we're the wise virgins that were ready, had our oil full, ready for the groom to come. And do you know how He comes? He comes at night time. And what they would do, the groom would enter the town and they'd be singing and dancing. It would be loud. It would be boisterous. And, 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 the, and, and, the, and the bride would hear the groom coming. But you know what they would call that? They would say that he would come like a thief in the night. You don't want to be caught unawares when the groom comes because you're always ready. Why? Because God loves you. Because unto us a child is born. Unto us the son is given. God has organized for us to marry his son, enter into a beautiful, intimate relationship where he desires you. Two other real quick practical concepts we need to wrap our mind around. We're looking forward to seeing his face. But you know, Jesus, I believe, is in heaven going, Dad, is it time yet? Is it time? Can I go? Can I go collect my bride? Can I go yet? I mean, what groom on his wedding day isn't amped to go see his bride? Particularly in a Jewish wedding, because they start with the honeymoon first and then the wedding banquet. Now, we'll get to that another time. <laughs> and one more thing. Do you know, we always recommend to our young people, don't be unequally yoked. I've shared this with you before, but I want to reiterate this today, particularly on Christmas. We said, don't be unequally yoked. You know, it just leads to trouble if, if, if you're living a righteous life and, and they're not quite interested in that. Well, you know Jesus isn't unequally yoked. That when you receive that cup of joy and you take on that Jeremiah 31, 31 covenant and you take him on as yourself, you receive the gift of Holy Spirit as the bride price, the seal, the promise of the fact that he's going to return for you. You become the righteousness of God and you then are equally yoked with Jesus Christ. You're worthy to marry Jesus. Why? Not because of your performance, but because He made you worthy. Because He's the one who washed you white as snow 
and said, I choose you. I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life that where I am, you may be also.